Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 4. We're going to be in verses 12 to 17, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's been tempted in the wilderness. He's already been baptized to fulfill all things. He's following the plan of the Father. And he's bringing a clear message of repentance now. And then next week, we're going to look at him calling his disciples when he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I want you to just know one thing and keep this in your mind over the next couple weeks. All of this is strategic by God. He's doing something. He's got a perfect plan. It's all a part of his purpose. Jesus trusts the Father, and he's going to execute in the place with the proclamation that God has ordained. If you'll stand one final time, let's read these verses together, and then we'll jump right in. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is God's word to us. You may be seated. Let's go to him together in prayer. Father, we submit ourselves to you now in the preaching of your word, the receiving of it. Help me please to be a faithful servant to my brothers and my sisters. We are at your mercy. We want to surrender to your truth. We want to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. We want to be taught and we want to be exhorted and commanded forward. I know in my own life, I know so many here as well share the same goal and drive to live all out for your glory, not just today on Sunday, but tomorrow, wherever you have us, in whatever role you've placed us in. We want to follow in the footsteps of our Lord in ministry Use this text to convict us wherever the Holy Spirit desires, expose things in our life that are out of order, and affirm our purpose as your people here and now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to get right into it and unpack three realities about Jesus' ministry in the sense that he's just beginning. So three realities about the beginning of his ministry. Number one will be God had appointed the time. We're going to look at God's timing. Number two, God had appointed the place. I want you to see the strategic nature of God in where he puts Jesus. And then number three, we're going to look at this reality that God had appointed the message, what Jesus said how he said it, right in line with what God wanted him to do. There's a lot here that we can apply, and I'm sure the Lord will lead us in that, but let's jump right in. Number one, God had appointed the time. Look at verses 12 and 13. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, that's John the Baptist, he withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun, and Naphtali. Now, at first glance, you see the word withdrew, and maybe you think, oh, this is retreat. He's fearful. John, meaning John the Baptist, has been put in prison, and Jesus goes, hey, I, I got to go. I don't want to get in prison. I don't want to be busted. I don't want to have trouble. But that's not actually what is happening. That'd be reading too much into the text. Now, is Jesus strategic at times? Sure. When the Pharisees are going to try to get him and kill him, when there's people after him, he will withdraw or retreat or he'll move into certain places with a purpose because it's not time to die yet. But in that regard, he's never fearful of anyone saying, oh no, they're coming to get me. They got John. I got to go or I can't really be bold about the truth or I don't want to press too many buttons. No, no. This is all part of God's plan. It's just describing his movement. The word withdrew just means to depart from a location to another. And in this context, it's not retreat. It's advance. Why? Because the Baptist has done his job. He's proclaimed, prepare the way. The Lamb of God is coming. Now, the Lamb has come. 
The setup man played his role. Jesus now is the starter. He's in. He's coming in to do the job. It's his time. And basically, John ending up in prison is the trigger for Jesus to begin public ministry. The one has come and paved the way, and now the one of all ones has come, and he is the way. You could say it that way. Uh, Matthew 14 kind of shows us all that's going on with John, and I want you to go there. Just turn ahead to Matthew 14 so I can show you what exactly is happening with John the Baptist. What's with his imprisonment? Uh, How is all this tied in? We'll get there anyway and walk through that text uh, in a number of months when we reach chapter 14, but for now, I do want to give you a glimpse of it because it may not shock you, or it may that what got John put in prison was not necessarily telling people, believe in God, believe in God, God loves you, but rather his views and the truth on a whole other matter. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work within him. You see that happen and you go, "Uh, what do you mean? John the Baptist is dead. Jesus, when is this? What Matthew's doing is showing you what happened to John. And remember, Matthew's not chronological. He's a little different. Like most of us, we would look at a timeline and I like those visuals where we're seeing everything in order. Matthew's not doing that in his gospel. He's giving you storylines that help you see the whole picture. And in this regard, what he's done is jump you right into Herod saying, hey, this Jesus guy's getting famous. It's got to be John back from the dead because I've already had him killed. And you're going, wait, what? What happened? He died? How'd you kill him? And then Matthew says, four in verse three, for Herod had seized John. Now he's going to tell you what happened. And he bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, It's not lawful for you to have her. You go, "Uh uh-oh, what happened? Well, Philip, he's a royal. This is like straight out of the British tabloids. Philip is a royal. He's married to Herodias. Herod gets a little visit from Philip and Herodias. Herodias, named because of her narcissistic father, who was Herod, of course, names her Herodias. No offense to those of you who have named your daughter's name a version of your own, but in this case, Herod was absolutely a crazy narcissist. They're hanging out. They're hanging out. She has an affair with Herod, and then they go on and get married. So he literally takes his brother's wife, and now we have tabloid drama. John the Baptist comes in and says to them, not believe in God. Jesus loves you. No, he says, you are disobeying God. It's unlawful for you to have her. He goes after Herod's lifestyle decision. It's not his view on the gospel, per se, that gets him put into prison and beheaded. It's his view on marriage. It's his view on lifestyle. He's calling Herod and Herodias to obey God. They hate that kind of command. They'll have none of it. But Herod is afraid to mess with them. Although he wanted to put him to death, verse 5, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. People loved John. They revered him. But when his birthday came, Herod had a birthday. The daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. This is no surprise. He's a lustful man who commits adultery and steals his brother's wife, and now he's lusting after this gal dancing before him. He cannot control his passions. He'll have whatever he wants when he wants it, and the woman he's having an affair with knows that completely. She's the one who has him wrapped around her finger. She says to her daughter, when he asks you, what do you want? I'll give it to you. He's so swooned. I want you to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. So that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she wants. He's all impressed by the dancing. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a silver platter. I imagine it being silver because all the cartoons I watched when I was a kid had a silver platter right there. The king is sorry. 
He doesn't necessarily want to. But because of his oath and the guests, everybody's watching. You going to keep your word, Herod? He does. And the head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came, took the body, and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Isn't it remarkable? First, John goes to prison for calling on Herod to obey God in his lifestyle, not necessarily believe in Jesus and you'll go to heaven. Although the gospel is attached to obedience, you, Paul many times says, obey the gospel. But we're so swooned by this sort of American version of, of the gospel where we just say, God loves you. Just believe. I'm trying to build bridges, man. I just want people to know God loves them. God loves them. And so we don't go as far as repent and believe. Change your mind about the way you're living. Turn from your sin. Obey him. Your life has to change or else your faith isn't real. Why? Because when God saves somebody, the Holy Spirit comes in, and He doesn't do roommates, and when you come into contact with Him, you will change. If you're not changing, you're not a true believer. That's the real gospel. The good news is Jesus died for sinners, and the sinners are destined for wrath and hell. But if they'll place their faith in Christ, He will transform them now and also secure for them an eternal home in heaven. And if you've really been transformed at the root of your life, then the fruit will be born in your life. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And so John is really just enacting what God would call a true follower to be. It is more likely, church, that you or I will get into trouble for our views on obedience to God, our views on lifestyle, our views on marriage, than we ever will if I stand up here and say, believe in God. If I tell people marriage is between one biological man and one biological woman, it is a monogamous relationship committed until death in covenant with one another before God, no deviations, no adultery, no take it for a test drive, no, ah, I'm bored and she doesn't look like she used to. It's time for me to have fun and go back to the old days. No rendezvous, no abandonment. No, all in. That will make people hate you way more than believe in God. God will make your life so much better. But rather, we call people to obey God not because, oh, and he'll make everything better. He'll give you what you want. No, because he is all in all. He's the one we worship. He's the one we adore. He's the king of heaven and earth, and so we submit our lives to him in worship. John was a man of the truth. He preached all of God's truth. Repent, yes, but also obey, and he paid for it with his life. But that was the job. That was God's appointed time for him. He paved the way, and he did it faithfully. And I want you to think about this in terms of our lives and just overall God's character. His timing isn't always predictable, but when he makes it clear, we move in obedience. Amen? When God has said what to do, we do it. And John did that so well. Now, you and I, we would have written John's story a little differently. Maybe... If it were me, I might have written in that he, he, he gets to be one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Doesn't that sound a little more uh, like how you and I would write? A little happier. He's still going to die, but he gets to hang with his second cousin for a little while. Maybe he could help. John the Baptist, in my opinion, would make great pulpit supply for Jesus. When Jesus couldn't go preach, John could. You could divide and conquer. At the very least, let him grow a little older in the mix. Let him see the fruit of all that he labored for. I mean, the guy was out in the desert eating locusts and wild honey, wearing camel hair. He was the laughing stock. At least let him see the fruition of the mockery he endured. But no. Why? Because God's timing. He trusted the Lord. He's an example of how God's servants operate. He fulfilled his calling. He obeyed his orders. He preached God's full counsel. And according to God's timing, he lived his life. And it ends in a way that you and I almost think, oh, this must have been so hard. He's in a prison cell. Jesus is out there. And I know that John has basically already told his disciples who were saying, hey, look, this guy's baptizing all these people. He's getting all these followers now. What's the deal? John says, you guys, He's the one. And then that's when we get the famous saying. He says, he must increase, I must decrease. In other words, what do you think the point was? It was never about me. So he already knows in theory, Jesus is the man. He's the guy. He's the one. 
but now it's going to come into practice. And you all know theory and practice are two different things. I could tell you a truth, but when I got to live that truth, it's different. John is in a prison. He's wasting away. And the clanking of prison keys gets closer and closer and closer. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe he can hear the faint music of the party going on a few levels up from the dungeon. And he's wondering what this is all about. And the jailer just says, hey, you, Baptist, let's go. What is it? You'll see. He's let out, head chopped. We got to go. Get it on the platter. Give it to the girl. The king is waiting. That's it. No fanfare. I mean, we see him in the pages of Scripture. Sure. He would be in the, in the hall of faith, so to speak, to us. But it's not all glorious for him. God's timing was for John to do his job. It's a reminder for us who are so busy trying to preserve our life, trying to hold on to this world, trying to be known or, or have our legacy be known. Everybody's kind of chasing their own version of the, the Kobe Bryant statue. We're so concerned, legacy, and, and will I be remembered? And, and oftentimes we're, we're thinking about how we can be remembered instead of just going all out while you live, letting the Lord handle the rest. But John the Baptist is later called the greatest because he served. He's known but for his faithful service. Now the time has come for the Son of God to fulfill his mission. And that's what Jesus does in the same way. That's how it goes. It's all about the Father's will. It's all about him redeeming his people. It's about the mission of God. Christ, his coming, redeeming, then commissioning you and I as disciples to go get more sheep, bring them. He's going to save them and establish his kingdom. I love the, the quote from Nicholas von Zinzendorf. He says, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. It's such a helpful reminder. You go hard while you're here. And, and I know, sure, like you're, you're kids will remember you and your great grandkids will remember you. And, and maybe in, in my family, my great, great grandkids will say, yeah, our great, great grandfather, um, you know, it was Costi, he was a preacher. Great. But over time, really the memory fades. They have no clue about the generation past. You and I, in a hundred years, no one will really remember us. We're, we're, we're a vapor. As one friend of mine said not long ago, he said, the, the, the pen of church history is likely to elude you. No one's going to really write about us. Maybe we end up in a, a journal for our kids and a, a photo album. But in the end, what are we living for? Are we living for all that? Are we living to be uh, one whose legacy has been preserved? No, we're living for the Lord, for his gospel, for his people to be faithful. That's what we want to do while we're here. And in the end, you're not going to be in heaven looking down saying, how does my statue look? I hope they're doing the landscaping around that headstone. I like the grass green when I was alive. I want it green when I'm dead. No, you're going to be in glory looking at Christ, thinking about him, worshiping him. And oh, if we would just get that into our heads now, how much of our lives would change the way we live. More eternal perspective, more submission to God's timing. The goal isn't to be Time Magazine's top 100 most influential people. The goal is to be faithful, to fill up the time you've been given, to use every breath you have, every resource you've been given for God's purposes. And when God's appointed time for you to be done has come, you are done. It is. He must increase. I must decrease. I was sitting with a, a Russian pastor last week at Shepherd's Conference. We're sitting at this table, and a friend of mine says, you've got to connect with this brother. He's a dear, dear brother. Would you, would you connect with him? I say, I'd love to. So we get in a text chat. I end up at the table. I sit with him. Pastor Brett's next to me, and we just begin to ask the man about his ministry and all that's going on, and he's very humble. The man next to him is sort of saying more for him because this Russian pastor, um, who I won't name for purposes you'll know in a moment, is very uh, humble. And the man next to him says, you must hear about his influence in Russia. I said, what, what's been going on? He said, just recently, recent years, he was asked to be Putin's spiritual advisor. I said, wow, it's amazing. And he said, yeah, no, 
And I said, you turned it down, of course? He said, yes, of course. I said, why? Um, he said, because it is only to tell him what he wants to hear. If not, you're dead. I said, okay, that's helpful. Um, and then he says, it's, it's hard, but this is ministry. And I said, are you concerned? Like, what now? You turned him down. Nobody turns him down. And he said, yes. They said to me, he says in just his most epic Russian accent, he said, they tell me, you will pay. He just sits there looking at, you will pay. I said, like what? Pay what? And he said, no longer uh, president of this society, no longer this, no longer. He's been listing the posts that they just pull out from under his feet. And he says, and I go back now from this trip because they know some things. I'm like, Okay. And he goes, because social media and all that. And I'm like, do you not post? Do you keep everything in? And he goes, no, I post very much the gospel and everything. I'm not scared. I'm like, okay. And he said, when I go back, I could get arrested any day. And I said, why? Like, what, what is that like for your family? What is that like for you? How, wait. And then I stopped. I said, wait, how will you keep my number? We want to talk to you. I want to tell our church about you. We want to support you. He said, we have computer. I was like, Okay. He says, everything goes on computer before they go home. The phones get wiped because, he says, they scroll my phone. I said, how long are you there? Like an hour or two hours? He goes, you never know. You just sit and do what they tell you and then maybe go home. I'm like, this is legit. This is the real deal. Like, you're on the front lines. And I remember saying, like, what if you die? What, if, what, what, what do you think about your life? What, what you, do you do to process all of this? And he says... Basically, in his own words, I'm, I'm here to be useful while I'm here, and when he's done, I'm done. And I just thought that was so helpful, not just for me as a fellow pastor with him, but it, it's for you. It's for all of us. When you think about your life, why you're here, how long it's going to last, what you're going to do, how you're going to leverage all that God has given you in this appointed time for his purposes, that's really what it comes down to. You don't have to live with fear. You don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds. You don't got to worry what you're going to be. You don't got to worry, well, how my kids and my kids' kids, and what about this? It's simple. When he's done, you're done. You can't hold on. You can't buy another day. You can't buy another hour. You can't buy another minute. It's all him. He's in total control. I think spending time with men like that helps me, I want to pass that along to encourage you that God had appointed the time that John would preach and prepare, and he had appointed the time that Jesus would preach and redeem. Neither would shirk back, neither would try to preserve their life, both submitted to God, and that is the reminder for us. He has saved you, he's called you, he's gifted you, he's purposed you, and he's placed you where you are at this time. And you are to use up all that time for his purposes because soon enough, time will be And next, we see that God has also appointed the place, number two. In verses 13 to 16, he withdrew to Galilee. He leaves Nazareth. He comes and settles in Capernaum. It's by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. And this fulfills what the prophet Isaiah has spoken. Now, pause there. We're going to get into that prophecy in a second. I just want to remind you, Matthew's goal is most always to use Old Testament prophecy to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the one that the prophets spoke about and foretold. So you can rest assured that he's the Messiah. You should believe in him. You should obey him. You should worship him. He's the one. And he uses this prophecy from Isaiah 9 that I want you to turn to because you'll understand it better. And there's a few other really fun surprises when you get into Isaiah 9 because of chapter 8 that I want to show you. And this will help you really understand Basically, the answer to this question, what is God doing? Why has he sent Jesus here to Galilee of the Gentiles, it says, by the way of the sea, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, beyond the Jordan? What's with the people in darkness? They see a great light, and they're sitting in a land, shadow of death, all of that. What is God doing? I want to show you. Isaiah 9. The context of this chapter includes a particular passage we typically read at Christmas. I want you to just real quick look down to verse 6 before we read verse 1. This will give you the cheat sheet. Look ahead. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, the government will rest upon his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
This is a Christmas passage. We always read it at Christmas. We go, turn in your Bible to Isaiah 9, verse 6. And I want to tell you about the baby who came in a manger. That's all good and well, but don't miss this. The whole picture here is that there is one who is coming, who will be the redeemer. He will be the savior, and he will go to a certain place to establish and grow and advance his kingdom. But there will be, look at verse 1, no more gloom for her who was in anguish. That's his people. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. Both of those, by the way, two of the tribes that were given land when the promised land was divided up back in Joshua 19. If you want to just write that down in a margin somewhere, you can go and look and read Joshua 19, and you'll see that Zebulun and Naphtali are given portions of the promised land. This is God's people. This is very important. They were the chosen ones, the favored ones, but now look what he says about them. He's treating them with contempt. This is judgment. They've been rebellious. They haven't been following God. But later on, he will make it glorious, it says. By the way of the sea, look where he's going to do it. On the other side of the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. It's the same place now Jesus is coming. Verse 2, the people who walk in darkness are going to see a great light. It's Christ. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. In chapter 8, if you just peek back, you, if you have headers in your Bible, you might see a header that says, Damascus and Samaria fall. This is God's judgment on unbelieving Israel, rebellious Israel. They're against him. So he sends Assyria to siege them and destroy them, and now they're under Assyrian oppression. There will be a believing remnant in verse 9. That begins to get unpacked, and then, of course, the one will come one day who will bring a people to himself, and his light will invade their darkness. What is Matthew trying to tell his original audience? That Jesus is that one that he has been sent to this place to bring light, the light of life. And it's significant first and foremost because it fulfills prophecy and proves who Jesus was to them, but there are some other things that God is doing here that I want to unpack for you. And so here's three more. Why does he do it? Well, it's prophetic fulfillment, but also it was a strategic location. Why does God send him there? Because Galilee of the Gentiles. This area, this region was a very high population place. There were an open-minded people there, a little different than Jerusalem where they were very pompous and the Pharisees were very arrogant and they were know-it-alls. He sends his son Jesus to this region. And that phrase, the way of the sea, it's not conjecture. It's not like, oh, it's by the water. No, that's the name of a road back then that was highly traveled, bringing population into the area. So it's very specific. It's a roadway that made it high traffic, bringing more people, which reminds you that God is a strategic God. He sends his son where there would be many people in need. He doesn't send his son to hide he doesn't even kill him in obscurity. He puts him on display to reach people, many people. Number two, it sends a clear message to the prideful Jews. Isaiah 9 is referring to those in spiritual darkness who are Israel in that context, but now Matthew uses it to describe those Jesus would be coming to reach. The Jews arrogantly looked down on Galilee, by the way. At one point in John chapter 7, they're arguing, the Pharisees are, and listen to what they say. They say with scoff, surely the Christ isn't going to come from Galilee. They have this attitude about where he's coming from. Galilee was looked down upon. It was, we've talked about this before, but the, the modern uh, translation of this in sort of, uh, you know, maybe your urban dictionary or the way that you might hear it is, hicks from the sticks. That's actually in commentaries. Men with PhDs use that as the illustration. People looked at those from Galilee the way that people disrespect today our blue-collar society and culture. Oh, those hicks. That's how arrogant and pompous they were. Where does God send his son? Right in there. 
not to the high and mighty in their own mind, not to the prideful and haughty, not to the know-it-alls, no, but to this region that was scoffed at. And here's the irony. If they would have paid closer attention to what the prophets said, they would have seen it right where it was. That's exactly where the Messiah was going to go. But they couldn't get past their own arrogant noses. He wasn't coming to Jerusalem. He was going to Galilee. That's where the needy would seek him and come. And third, what's God doing? What's he trying to show us? What's he communicating? Well, it's a foreshadow of the Great Commission. The same mission that you're seeing here is the same mission the king will call his disciples to, to go to the nations, not just to one people, but all people, to baptize, to teach, to reach. And the gospel has come to the Jew first, yes, Romans 1, 16 and 17 says that, meaning Jesus came from the Jewish people. He comes and calls the Jews to repent. John the Baptist goes to who first? The Jews. And the arrogant Jews at that time would have loved to leave it right there, to the Jew first and only. And God declares, and also to the Gentile, that God would bring a people, Israel, and a people, the Gentiles, as one people in him. No one's getting in because of ethnicity. No one's getting in because you were a covenant people from the Old Testament. No, there's one way in and one body when you're in through Christ. And this helps us understand the strategic nature of God. And that's what I, I kind of want to press in here is when you understand what Matthew's saying to his original audience and you look at all of this, you realize God is a strategic God. He's about his mission. He's about his purposes. He's appointed Christ right there in Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles, no less. And I can't help but think about how sometimes in our kind of Bible church world, we can bemoan that word strategy or strategic. You know what we say? I've been guilty of this in the past. You know, I go, oh, I'm not into strategy. I don't believe in strategy, strategy, strategy. Nothing but pragmatism. How to grow the church. You know, it's strategy. You know, I just need to preach the Bible, okay? Enough of this strategy. That's what I used to say when I was younger. It is strategic to preach the Bible. There's hungry people that need the Bible. It's strategic to preach the gospel. It's strategic to go to places where the gospel hasn't been. It's strategic to shape and plan ministry around how can we reach lost people and how can we equip the saints. It's strategic to be here right now, to be a Christian. Your God is a God of strategy. Our team is, is often strategizing about where to launch more shepherd groups. Pastor Brett, during the first hour, was in Barnes Hall training more shepherd group leaders. Why? Because our mission is make disciples who make disciples. If you don't train more leaders and establish more shepherd groups and raise more people up, well, then you're failing to have the mission. It just looks cute on a website. We make disciples who make disciples. We're strategizing about where to send short-term missions trip teams. I know some of you are going to Fiji in, in not very many weeks. And then what equip classes can we add? Because those are like bricks. They're building up the congregation. Uh, on a personal level, I'm strategic. I'm in the pulpit 80% of the year. I'm here. I'm doing my job. This is where my feet are anchored. But there's opportunities where someone will say, hey, can you come preach at this conference or come to this? Or, or the Russian pastor literally said, when the war is over, you come to Russia. I was like, great. It would give me a really good insurance policy. So you take care of Christine and the kids. I'll go. I'm down. I want to go to Africa maybe next summer. There's lots of opportunities. But we have to say, what's the strategy? What does this do? Am I going to another place where like eight people have already said the same thing and just going to hang out? Or are we going to advance the gospel? Are we just doing ministry to do ministry? It's fun to hang out and kind of socialize. Or are we actually advancing the gospel? The number one strategic question that we ask all the time as elders, how are people becoming more mature at Shepherd's House? I don't care about seat fillers. Great. Look at all the people. Okay, fine. How are they growing more mature? Are we growing more mature? I think of our building campaign, I think of the summer relocation, I think of all these things through the lens of this text, and the first thing I say is, Lord, I'm so sorry for not being more eager, more submissive, and more flexible to just whatever you want to do. Do it. 
Have your way. Let me just be faithful. I just want to obey you. I don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to lay low. I want to see people saved and sanctified. I want to follow you. There's a people sitting in darkness, and they're going to see a great light. That's Christ. Are we preaching Christ? There's a people, and, and they have not come to know the truth, and the truth needs to come to them. By the way, that's why our building campaign is called Lighthouse. Somebody really sweet recently said, hey, just a quick question, a little maybe concern that you could clarify. It was a great question. I love these questions. You can always ask me these questions. I'll always answer you straight. And I'm sitting there, he said, it looks like we've hired a consultant for our building campaign. I said, why? He said, it's just a little too clever, I think. Some people are worried. You know, it says Lighthouse, and it's kind of got that slogan, establishing a sanctuary for truth and community. It just it looks like a consultant is now involved. You know, are we do we have a consultant? I said, man, I really should have a side gig as a consultant. Because I sat in a room and we're like, what do you want to call it? And I was like, please just no weird manipulative like legacy or whatever the campaigns are called to get you to give more money and think about, oh, make sure to give millions of dollars so that we can make a, a pew and put your name on it. Like none of that. So I was like, you know, Lighthouse seems like a great name. Why? You put a lighthouse in darkness and people don't crash into the rocks, but they end up going where they're supposed to go. And they're like, great, you like it? I'm like, Brett, anything? He's like, ah, sounds good. I got a few other ideas. Sounds pretty good. I said, all right. And then, you know, we're establishing a sanctuary. What does that mean? It's kind of a safe haven, place of worship. I really don't like calling it an auditorium, even though we're the sanctuary. It's still a place where people gather. Like, all right, you can have your word sanctuary. I'm like, truth. And he's like, community and truth. We've got to be. I'm like, great, this is great. And then we did one thing. Called a friend who's a really good artist and said, could you make a logo for this? He said, sure. Now it'll go on t-shirts and we'll give those away to you at the building campaign. There's no consultant. It's simple. Lighthouse. It's in the Bible. There is a people who enter into the world. They are salt and they are light. There was a Savior who entered into the world. He is light and people find a life. We're just being like Jesus. I think some of you need to start being more strategic in your thinking about your life and where God has you. And what he's gifted you and what he's given you, who you are. He did not put you where you are by accident. I don't want you going into wherever you're going to go tomorrow, wondering if God has put you there on purpose and tiptoeing into Monday morning like, well, I just am not sure. No, be sure that if he wanted you anywhere else with any other gifts in any other place, he would have done it. You are right where you are for a reason. You use your faith. You use your gifts every faculty you have, and you unload the truth of God's word and the, the, the gospel and the love of God and his purposes wherever you are. He will use you. Why? He's a strategic God. Don't ever remove the strategic nature of God from his decisions and his decrees. He's always after his purposes. And who does he use? You, his people. That's what he's doing. You never have to be insecure. Am I really where God wants me to be? Yes, because you're there. Number three, God had also appointed the message. So if you're confident about where you're supposed to be, we see God's timing in the ministry of Christ, you, you can apply that to your life. And now where you are, certainly where he sent Christ, there's one aspect to this that we have to use and we cannot shirk from. He's given it, he's commanded it, and he's appointed it, and it's the message. You don't operate in the appointed time and the appointed place based on what you want to say or do. Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preparation is over, proclamation begins. Here it is. His ministry, it's marked by a gospel of repentance, which is change your mind. Turn from your ways. Obey God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And by the way, side note, what a compliment to John the Baptist that the message he preached is the same message Christ preached. If you want affirmation, there it is. You're not going to get a statue. You're going to lose your head. You're going to wither away in prison until they finally kill you. But you know what? When you get into glory, you are going to realize that the Son himself is preaching the same message you were when you were out in the wilderness. You were doing the job, John. Why? God has appointed the means of salvation to be the message of the gospel. Nothing else saves people. 
Nothing else fulfills God's purpose. Nothing else builds his kingdom. And that truth includes the call to all people to turn from their sinful rebellion and obey God and worship him with their entire life. You know, that's the essence of being a true Christian right there, that you say you believe and you live like you believe Don't ever buy the lie that Jesus just sort of loved people and lessened the weight of his ministry as though he just sort of went around being a good guy and being a moral example. No, he loved people by telling them the truth, and he told them that they needed God. He said on one occasion to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. If he said that to his disciples, do you really think that he's going to tell lost people, hey, you just do you? just love you. No, it's always been all in on Christ for all of your life, for all of his glory. Jesus, in a sense, in our modern vernacular, told people to get over themselves. The actual biblical translation of that is whoever seeks to gain their life, keep their life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will what? Will gain it. You'll have life if you give him your life. That's his message. And church, I don't know what the future holds for you, for me, for us. I just know this, that God has appointed our time to live in the same way that he appointed his son to come at that time. And he's appointed the place that we are in the same way that he appointed the place that his son would come. And it's here and it's now. But also, and perhaps most importantly, he's also appointed the message that must be proclaimed by his people. Are you sharing the gospel? Are you living for Christ? If people were asked, is so-and-so a Christian? Could you summarize in just a a brief sentence, you know, what so-and-so is living for? I'm not asking about their job description here at the company or your organization or your restaurant, but just in general, do you think they have like this higher purpose, larger? You know, what would you say they're really all about? A text like this reminds us that John the Baptist was all about it. Christ himself was all about it. The Father's will. That is ministry. That is our life. And we're all in it. It's not just the pastors. It is the people of God. He's appointed the message that will set the captives free, that will raise dead hearts to life. It's the way the Lord did ministry. It's how he still does it. And so let's follow him.